Okay. <laughs> well, good, good early or late morning, everyone. Welcome to our 11 o'clock briefing, the 2020 Census, Science, Accuracy, and Privacy. We have five terrific speakers with us today. They're Bob Groves, Provost at Georgetown University, Joe Salvo, Chief Demographer, New York City, John Abowd, Chief Scientist, the Associate Director for Research and Methodology at the U.S. Census Bureau, Jerry Ryder, Professor of Statistical Science at Duke University, and Ashwin Machinavalaja, Associate Professor of Computer Science at Duke University. And we'll get started. Thank you. I think I'm uh, first up. Uh, I'm Bob Groves. Uh, my only reason to be here probably has nothing to do with Georgetown University, but rather uh, in uh, 2010 I was the Census Bureau Director. My remarks in the session coming up are focused on five items that are my thoughts about uh, issues that should arise in 2020, reflecting on the kinds of things that happened in 2010. There are five in number. Uh, one, the criticality of, of cooperation of federal agencies, other federal agencies with the Census Bureau. In 2010, it was crucial that the Department of Justice judged that the uh, data collection and the protection of data uh, of the 2010 decennial census was exempt from the Patriot Act restrictions that might have been interpreted as restricting uh, 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 access of other agencies to the census data. Number two, uh, in 2010 we enjoyed, it, it's an odd verb I must admit, a very high unemployment rate. Now why? Why did Census Bureau enjoy that? It permitted the Bureau to hire a, a very large number of incredibly talented people who happened to be unemployed at the time. It is not clear whether that's going to be true for, for 2020. Number three, uh, uh, the existence of organized uh, resistance to the census. Uh, in 2010, there were calls by political leaders not to fill out the census form. As, uh, in, as, as they viewed it an unwarranted intrusion in the lives of the public. And there were <clears throat> minority groups that also, at a time, argued to resist the census. Number four, uh, the distrust of the federal government. This is ubiquitous, uh, has been present in this country uh, for decades and decades. Uh, it is an issue with regard of, of great importance in 2010 with regard to new immigrant groups who were uncertain about the role of the, of the central government in this country versus what they had experienced in their own countries, and that's an issue. And then five is uh, uh, a, a larger internet dependence this year. I remind us that internet was an option in 2000 and 2010, but not many people used it. This year, the Census Bureau will depend on that in, in a new way. And uh, the uh, vigilance with regard to how that is working is key. Those are my remarks. Um, <clears throat> as chief demographer in New York City, I specialize in looking at the census from a very local level. Um, as many of you already know, I believe that self-response is essentially the cornerstone of uh, the census. And the reluctance of people to self-respond, uh, increasingly so of the last few decades, um, means increasing reliance on the Census Bureau's non-response follow-up operations, or what we call NERFU. As you just heard, threats to privacy, mistrust of government, the climate of fear in immigrant communities, um, all uh, can compromise uh, self-response. I, I would go as far as to say that self-response is the gold standard when it comes to census taking. The non-response follow-up operation, as good as it is, and there are many elements of it that are very good, introduces error. Um, again, self-response being the gold standard. Errors in NERFU, as we call it, can take many forms. In, in 2010, we know that answers um, by a self-response were much better than those in non-response follow-up. 
largely because non-response follow-up um, relies on proxy respondents, Peop not the respondents themselves. Um, all efforts to get, when all efforts uh, to get people to respond fail, um, and the Census Bureau needs to complete the census, statistical imputation is used. And again, there have been great advances in that uh, statistical operation, but the non-response bias that gets introduced is again another form of error. So the consequences of NERFU error are, are most pronounced at the local level. For example, in 2010, there were a number of neighborhoods in New York City where um, housing units were erroneously classified as vacant. Now, while we can point the finger at the Census Bureau, what I am essentially arguing in New York is that we need to take responsibility to get people to answer initially. Uh, so this way, the opportunity or the door that opens with that error that I mentioned is not very large. Um, that will help to ensure a more accurate census. <laughs> Finally, the ability of local government, and again, I speak heavily, obviously, from my experience in New York City, to formulate policies and devise efficient strategies and programs to address the needs of our population are related to the definition of reality that is the census. That's what defines reality. And with all of its warts and its problems, so a few examples, I will close with a few examples. <laughs> An accurate population count is required for the creation of rates of disease, which def whether you can declare whether the city has neighborhoods with a public health crisis or not. If the denominators in those rates are not good, then essentially um, this leads to uh, erroneous, uh, perhaps erroneous efforts on the part of our health officials to pursue um, uh, strategies that frankly do not need to be pursued. Identifying changes in neighborhoods uh, uh, where we're redrawing school districts. How do you draw that line around a school? Again, we use census data for that. And then using age and sex data from the census as a basis for creating projections. We are like the rest of the country aging and we need to point to those neighborhoods where we think this over the short term and the longer term, this will be seen. And then finally, I want to say the data from the American Community Survey, um, for example, on the number of low risk, um, uh, low income, excuse me, at risk children for education grants. All the data from the wealth of the American Community Survey is based upon the decennial census, essentially. If the census is off, then the uh, population estimates and the, as we call it in demography, the controls and waiting for the American Community Survey is not right. So. Uh, I'm going to pursue this uh, in the afternoon session in much greater detail. Um, I just wanted to give you that overview. Thank you. Good morning. I'm John Abowd. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to um, talk to you about the 2020 census on the privacy protections that we have placed on our publications. I'm going to read the statement about this research that was posted on census.gov last night by the Deputy Director, Ron German. The Census Bureau takes seriously its legal and professional obligations to safeguard the information it gathers from the public. For this reason, we are modernizing and strengthening how we protect privacy in the statistics we release, starting with the 2020 Census. We are deploying differential privacy the gold standard for privacy protection in computer science and cryptography to preserve confidentiality in the 2020 census and beyond. Differential privacy was developed by researchers at Microsoft and is now utilized by many leading tech firms. There are many variants of differential privacy. The one selected for the 2020 census introduces controlled noise into the data in a manner that preserves the accuracy at higher levels of geography. Since the last decennial census, the data world has changed dramatically. Much more personal information is available online and from commercial providers, and the technology to manipulate those data is more par powerful than ever. Because we are sworn by law to protect your data, 
we are constantly testing and improving our privacy protection methods to stay ahead of these changes. While the risk of re-identification using the tabulations we have published from the 2010 census is limited, we know that the amount and accuracy of online personal information, as well as the computational power to analyze that information, continues to grow. Our recent research shows that the privacy protection methods we deployed to protect data for the 2010 census must be improved. Our researchers have been able to simulate a re-identification study using publicly available data. The accuracy of the data our researchers obtained from this study is limited, and the confirmation of re-identified responses requires access to confidential internal Census Bureau information. Nevertheless, our internal team demonstrated that an external re-identification study can match about half of the people enumerated in the 2010 census to commercial and other online information. However, more than half of these matches are incorrect, and an external attacker has no means of confirming them. We are continuing to engage the scientific community and all stakeholders to optimize our techniques for upcoming data products, including data from the 2020 census. Our differential privacy methods will be designed to preserve the utility of our legally mandated data products while also ensuring that every respondent's personal information is fully protected. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jerry Ryder from Duke. Um, <clears throat> my remarks in the upcoming session at 1.30 are focused on three main points. One, the methods used by the Census Bureau to protect the confidentiality of census participants' responses in earlier censuses no longer can be counted on to provide adequate protection for the 2020 census. Two, the Census Bureau is replacing these legacy confidentiality protection methods with state-of-the-art methods that provide provable guarantees of confidentiality protection. Three, the effect of these methods on the accuracy of the release counts depends on how the Census Bureau ultimately chooses to implement those methods. So let me expand on these points. The Census Bureau has always protected census participants' confidentiality. Indeed, the Census Bureau has a legal mandate to do so under Title 13. It has done so mainly by swapping households with similar compositions across county lines. So take a four-person household in Durham County, where I live, and swap them for a four-person household in Orange County, which is where UNC Chapel Hill is. It is generally believed that a small fraction of households are swapped. Uh, the rate is actually a state secret. Uh, thus, the amount of perturbations in the released data products may not be large enough to provide sufficient data protection, as um, Dr. Abad just mentioned. Indeed, the Census Bureau has done experiments suggesting that this is not the case. Intruders still might be able to use the released data products to learn that individuals with particular characteristics were in the data files, which could result in a violation of Title 13. Hence, the existing methods cannot be counted on to provide sufficient protection. A major problem with the legacy methods is that their privacy guarantees are based on a heuristic. It would be far stronger to have proof that there is privacy protection. The Census Bureau, therefore, is in 2020, is turning to the criterion of differential privacy, which is a mathematical definition of what it means to protect confidentiality in a data product. In a nutshell, they have designed algorithms that add noise to the counts from the collected census data and ensure that those algorithms satisfy this criterion. The algorithms come with knobs that control the amount of noise added to the counts, which in turn controls the privacy loss. Turning the knobs trades off privacy loss and accuracy. Lower privacy loss requires more noise, which means more distortion to the counts. Greater privacy loss allows less noise, which means less distortion to the counts. The Census Bureau has not yet set the values of the privacy knobs, nor made other decisions that will impact the risk accuracy trade-off for the 2020 Census. 
However, with their proposed technology, they will be able to assess the trade-offs, which should allow them to make principled decisions about their confidentiality protection policies, something that was much harder with the legacy protection methods. Hello, my name is Ashwin Machinwajala from Duke University. So increasingly, personal data about us is collected and released in aggregate form in many different scenarios. This is not just limited to statistical agencies like the U.S. Census Bureau, but it also extends to, extends to data released by medical organizations, data collected by smart devices, and so on. There is both theoretical and empirical evidence that statistical uses and releases of personal data, even in aggregated form, can disclose individual level information. And you will hear from Johnny about in today's 3.30 session about one such empirical study on the US, that the US Census Bureau ran, but there are other such studies in other domains as well. Differential privacy is a new paradigm inspired by cryptography that has, that allows, permits algorithms that provably bound the increase in privacy risk to an individual. It provides a mathematically precise way to reason about the trade-off between the privacy protections afforded to an individual and the utility of the resulting data releases. Equally important is the transparency that differentially private algorithms permit. Unlike legacy systems where you may have to hide certain algorithmic choices or parameters and make them secret to afford privacy, differentially private algorithms can be fully transparent. In fact, their implementations can be completely open source. And the protection comes from the actual instance of the noise added, but not from the parameters that are used in the algorithm. So like any privacy enhancing technology, differentiated private algorithms perturb the data to hide effects specific to an individual. Nevertheless, there is growing evidence that differentially private data releases preserve statistical properties of, of the release data. And you'll hear from me uh, about this in my talk in, three, three, uh, three, in the 3.30 session in this afternoon. So the 2020 decennial census is a pioneering effort that is using this novel and transparent paradigm to private data release. And I hope uh, several other organizations um, do the same in the future. Thank you. And before we take our first question, I just want to highlight, Ashwin, you had worked on one of the government's first data products to feature differential privacy. Is that right? That, that was? That's correct, yes. That's, okay, All right. In, in, 2000, in 2008, U.S. Census Bureau was the first to use differential privacy in one of their products. And uh, I was fortunate enough to help them build this algorithm. Okay, very interesting. All right, first question here. Kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. Thank you. Uh, Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press, uh, for, for John about. Um, in terms of this release, you say about 50% of people who, of households information can be found from 2010. What type of information can be found this way in, did, that your team has found? I mean, is it just name and age, or how much detailed information is it are we looking at? And second, given that this has happened with the 2010 data, and you have the issue of citizenship that may um, lessen people who want, uh, are afraid of, want, uh, afraid of being <coughs> targeted for uh, prosecution or whatever, um, deportation, do you think that your, the release of this issue that you found is going to decrease uh, make people further distrust the census and make the issue of asking a non-science verified question about uh, citizenship standard tougher. Thank you for those questions. I may actually have, <laughs> have to get you to repeat the second ones, but I'll start, I'll start with the first one. Um, the full text of my remarks at 3.30 today has already been posted in the newsroom. I, I hope that you downloaded it. Uh, if you haven't, you should. Uh, it's it, not on the census.gov website. It is not on the census.gov website. It was quarantined until 
a few minutes ago, okay. but it has been released to the newsroom of this conference, oh, okay. and you should be able to get it from there. I put it there personally. Okay. Um, why, so it has the exact statistics in it. Um, I don't want to do all the details here to answer your question because that's more properly handled in the, in the uh, full session. But what we used was the product called Summary File 1, which is the main release of the 2010 census. Uh, that release has approximately 8 billion statistics in it that relate to five variables. The block that you live in, your age in years, your sex, your race according to the 63 categories that you can uh, check under the 1997 OMB standard, and your ethnicity, Hispanic or not. So those are the five variables that uh, were reconstructed in the microdata. The block, sex, and age variables in the reconstructed microdata were then matched to commercial data to acquire names and addresses. And then the complete record, the personal identifying information, block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity from the reconstructed record was compared to the official confidential record on all of those variables. So the exact percentage that you could construct externally was 45% of the population about 138 million people. And the percentage that were correct was 38% of those, or about 52 million people, 17% of the population. The Census Bureau, when it released the 2010 data, said that the primary confidentiality protection mechanism was to induce uncertainty when an external attacker claimed to have re-identified a particular household in those data. Our experiments confirm that there is uncertainty, and I've just given you a quantified lower bound on that uncertainty. And so uh, the system worked, but our experiments reveal that just in 10 years, one's ability to do this has gotten so much uh, better that it's not viable to keep protecting a census the way we protected it in 2010 and 2000 and 1990. So we had, to, we had to use a new tool. And we went for the state of the art gold standard tool. So now I'm going to morph into your second question. And um, some of you may know that I've been asked questions like this under oath uh, quite a few times in the last several months. Uh, this is essentially the answer that I gave in those situations. When we release the data from the 2020 census, whether it contains a citizenship question or not, the detailed tables will all be protected by differential privacy. The microdata records that feed the tabulation system will be outputs from that differentially private system, not inputs to it, and therefore they will be fully protected. Those records, when they enter the tabulation system, don't contain any residents' real data. They contain the data that have been privacy protected by the methods that Dr. Ryder and Dr. Machanavahala will talk about in other sessions in order to ensure that we have provably controlled the risk of re-identification and we will provide all of the code and all of the parameters well in advance. Okay, question here. I'd like to you to address two things, and I have to have give your you a affiliation. Quick, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Tom Keenan from the Business Edge in Canada, and the first one is you don't need to know for certain. <laughs> so there's a Stanford professor who has uh, a program that uh, guesses at your gender, uh, at your sexual orientation, uh, with about 82 percent accuracy. Now you may say, well, that's not a zero-one type of thing, but if I were, say, Orbitz, a travel agency, I might show someone a gay cruise, and you know they might say, well, uh, that's of no interest to me because you guessed wrong. So I want you to address, first of all, the fact that it's not exactly uh, a question of whether you know for sure, but that pretty good information is there. I'd also like you to address the question of some people being more interesting than others. So the premier of our province enrolled in a university 
the registrar knew that someone would go after his records, so he kept them locked on a piece of paper in his desk. So if someone is targeted, a kind of targeted spear phishing, how, do you, how does your methodology address that? So I can, I can start addressing that question. So um, differential privacy approximates <coughs> something like privacy for all, okay? It gives a, a guarantee about what an attacker can infer about individuals, right? It's not a zero one kind of guarantee. That is, if there is uncertainty about the individual, then there is privacy. It doesn't state that kind of a guarantee. Um, in particular, what it, the kind of guarantee it says is the following. Like whether an individual participated in this uh, in this data release or not, whether your, your data was included in the data release or not, the outputs of these algorithms are statistically indistinguishable. That is, an adversary cannot tell apart from looking at the output whether you were in the data set or you were not in the input of the data set, right? So you take any property of that individual, right? Then if you had some amount of uncertainty about that property based on looking at the output if the individual participated in the study, then even, the, even if the individual was not, the individual's data was not in the output, in, in the input to this, uh, into this algorithm, the adversary's sort of inference about the individual will be roughly the same, right? So it's actually a very strong guarantee about sort of the adversary's uncertainty and it, it does not have the issues that, that you sort of mentioned. Right, so the other point that I want to mention is that this guarantee holds despite the existence of side information from other sources. So the differential privacy guarantee says that the, the increase in privacy risk to you based on this specific data release is bounded. Your, your privacy may already be breached by other data releases Right? then there's nothing you can really do in that case. right? But the increase to your privacy risk due to this specific data release is bounded. It's not, the, it's not due to this data release that your privacy is breached. Okay? There was discussion of the trade-off in the knobs, the, the privacy and the accuracy. So how will you resolve on just where the knobs should be set? What will that process look like? John, do you want to talk about yeah, that? I think I'm going to have to take that one. So, so um, beginning in December of, or sorry, September of 2016, we made public presentations to the Census Scientific Advisory Committee about the research program for implementing differential privacy in the 2020 census. And one of the factors that has been stressed in all of those publications is that picking a point on the accuracy privacy loss trade-off curve is a policy decision and not an engineering decision. The charge to the engineering team is to make those calculations as accurate as possible for a given setting of the knob that sets the privacy loss. And then it's the job of the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee at the Census Bureau to choose a point. For the 2018 end-to-end -end test, they set the key privacy loss parameter, if you know the mathematics of this, that's epsilon, at 0.25 and the products will be released on March 28th uh, with that setting for uh, potential users to examine. Just follow up on yeah. that. Can you put that in a one to 10 scale? Mm -hmm. If 10 is privacy, <laughs> ultimate <laughs> privacy, and one, uh, like one is, is zero, no privacy, um, you know, but more accuracy, where is the point zero two one five? So I'm going to decline to answer that question and ask you to come to the Sunday morning session because I can either spend the rest of this press beefing <laughs> setting that up or you can listen to me set it up in full detail. I will answer the following way. Everyone agrees that there's a setting of the privacy loss parameter, zero, at which there is zero accuracy. Okay, that's one end. The problem is the other end is infinity. And so your, uh, your question, 
doesn't have a well-posed answer in mathematics, and you basically have to talk about what the accuracy measure means and how close your accuracy approaches to the accuracy you would have gotten in the absence of uh, privacy-enhanced analysis techniques being applied to the data. And that I'd like to talk about in a more nuanced way. Can you say more privacy than less? I mean, in other words, if there's a midpoint, are you above <coughs> the midpoint aiming at privacy, or are you below it aiming at, um, I know it's no midpoint when you have, it, it's hard to say a midpoint <coughs> when you have an infinite, but just to give a sense of where you are on this knobs, I mean, I think that's a key, as you say. How about knobs, if I do this? The system that Ashwin just talked about a few minutes ago, I was also on the engineering team for, was the one that was released for the product called On the Map. Uh, the epsilon in that product is 8.9. If you use the Google Rapport system in, uh, if you use the Chrome browser, the Google Rapport system is being used on you. The epsilon for any particular variable is around two but the total epsilon is someplace between 10 and 14 per day. If you use iOS um, uh, on your iPhone, uh, Apple hasn't released the cumulative epsilon, but engineers have reverse engineered it and put it in the range of 12 to 14, again, per day. So in terms of privacy protection, 0 0.25 is stunningly good. In terms of accuracy, it depends upon how you're going to use the data, and that I would prefer to discuss in a more uh, uh, nuanced form. Question here, and then we'll come here. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I've always wondered about is you guys talk a lot about protecting individual privacy, and especially in the context of, um, uh, well, I'll say, uh, say uh, citizenship. What about community privacy? I mean, <clears throat> the ability to target uh, a neighborhood and then, you know, say, maybe plan to, you know, hang out at the library and look for people or hang out at the, at a local um, uh, school or something like that. Is that, is that possible? And would that be something that could be pr protected? And can we have your affiliation, please? Sorry, Eric Vance, I'm a freelancer. I can start addressing that question. Maybe you can continue. So, the nice thing about differential privacy is that not only does the mathematics give you a guarantee for an individual, it also has a natural way to extend that protection to arbitrary groups of individuals. So in particular, uh, John talked about this concept of this parameter or a privacy loss parameter called epsilon that will be associated with each individual that sort of quantifies what is the bound what is the bound on the information sort of uh, revealed about an individual, right? So if you have a group of K people, then properties about, the, about this group of K people are afforded a protection of K times epsilon. Of course, the larger and larger the group becomes, the privacy protection about that group becomes smaller and smaller, but the same sort of, you can already use this technology to sort of infer privacy protections for for s at least for small groups. Is that automatic or is that, is that something you have to go out of your way to do? No, it just, it just comes automatically with the privacy definition itself. We don't really need to do anything. On the, uh, that said, if your goal, if you knew upfront that you had, to, you had to have tighter privacy protection for larger groups, you can optimize your algorithms for that. I will talk a little bit about this during my talk later at 3.30. If you come to the talk, you'll, you'll understand. We have a comment from Joe, and then we'll take a question here. Yeah, um, what we're doing in New York now is we're preparing to take the material that Dr. Abau just referred to, um, for example, from the uh, 2018 census test, and the other materials that are being released by the Census Bureau, and look at what happens at the local community level and our ability to discern differences and to compare communities. Okay, that looking at the data that is the output essentially from uh, the differential privacy uh, uh, process. Uh, we are preparing to, we're preparing to make this evaluation, um, trying to keep obviously an open mind on all of this, um, but there is a concern that it, for small areas um, that the introduction of, of noise uh, may be an issue. But the great thing about it is that 
there is a way to empirically examine this, and that's what we're looking forward to doing. I'm Jeff Mervis with Science. A question for Joe following on that. Could you talk a little bit about, from New York City's perspective, the status of efforts for community partnerships and addressing any kind of you know, issues of concern that you find from you know, the low participation, whether it's from the end-to-end -end or more generally, and if you have a sense of how that compares to where we were in 2010. Well, I'm, I'm always looking for silver linings. Um, and one of them is the level of awareness regarding 2020 is just uh, astounding. <laughs> um, we have an effort going on in New York City that involves multiple agencies, the private sector. Um, we have pro bono services from a number of, of um, organizations. Um, we're doing uh, survey research. I, I uh, turn you to a recent Quinnipiac poll that was provided um, by the Association for Better New York. Um, Global Strategies is involved. There's a number of different organizations are working with. Um, now, having said that, the challenges, as I outlined earlier, are, are just very, very substantial, you know, this time around. Um, but the, the outreach effort in New York, though, I want to underscore, is different in many ways from what you would do in other places in the country. One of the things I will point out this afternoon is that um, we have, in New York, several immigrant communities with um, large numbers of rental units, um, uh, large numbers of persons who do not speak English well. These are on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, and several of them had the highest self-response rates in 2010. And it kind of, so we created our own model in New York because, uh, but the other issue too is that we have a lot, we have a lot to lose in those communities in New York. Um, because the trusted voices that were employed last time around to increase self-response in those communities, they're asking us questions about, uh, about things like confidentiality um, and, and about uh, protections, um, many of which you, you're hearing about here. So um, yeah, I'll stop there. Let me, let me just jump in on that too. Uh, relative to 2010, I think there is empirical evidence that the uh, organiza that kind of the national organization of local leaders on this started earlier uh, in this decade than 2010. That's all good news. Um, the learning, I think, in 2000 and 2010 was that national media and national communication, while valuable, is not uh, as efficient as getting local uh, and uh, a, a local community leader in a uh, subgroup can, can have much more influence than any national media. And as Joe said, that means you tailor the approach to every community. It becomes their census. And when that happens, uh, the, the voluntary response goes up, which as Joe said, is the key to the cost and accuracy of, of the census. Now we have some students here today. Do you have any questions in the group? Okay. Yeah. And we have one in the front row. Or do you have one? Uh, side? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You're, okay. You're then a we'll go to the back. Too. I'm their group chair. Yeah. We're all students. Yeah. I'm, I am their professor. Uh, Dr. Groves, since it was your census, the 2010 census, that uh, <laughs> this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, this was your. Do you, do you feel that it, there was it was as something done wrong, or this was the best you could do? <laughs> and then the other part of this is, there is the you know the case that's going to go to the Supreme Court on the citizenship question. Can you address the issue of uh, should the census be asking a question that hasn't gone through the scientific rigors of other questions? Mm -hmm. Why or why not should that happen? And how does that, and how you see if, if it relates at all to the revelation about the 2010 census mm -hmm. uh, privacy loss and, um, and whether you think it will affect the 2020 census? In 1790, the census was conducted by federal marshals uh, on horseback mainly. And uh, when they had completed their counts, 
the count for the community was nailed onto the, a, a public wall. Um, we've changed as a, <laughs> as a country. And if you, if you become a, a student of the evolution of the census, every census shows innovations relative to the prior, and the seeds of the innovation for the next census are planted in the census. I view this as a continuous improvement every 10 years going on. So um, this, this is how the US does censuses. Uh, your second question about the citizenship question, uh, I, I'm a member of the National Academy of, of, of the uh, Committee on National Statistics, which has opined on this issue that you can go to nap.edu. Uh, and there it's very clear that uh, on the, the technical community's view of this is that uh, just as when we develop a drug, we don't go from the chemistry lab to humans, uh, we can't invent measures on, on humans that are questions and immediately go to a decennial census. Testing is needed and the, the history of research in this is that very subtle wording and positional changes of a, of a question in a thing like the census can have enormous impact way beyond those that we as humans can predict. You need experimentation and testing. Uh, to know those things. So it's very, very risky on the measurement side. And then on the other side, if, if a question um, changes how the American public views the census, that can affect their decision to self-respond. And again, as Joe said, you lose self-response, you lose control of the cost of the census and the quality of the census. Question in the back. <coughs> I'm Melissa Van Zant, a student at NYU. Um, can any of the private data collected be sold to companies for them to use and target consumer populations? I don't think any of us could hear the question. Could you repeat it, please? Uh, uh, can you sell the data yeah. to yeah. private yeah. entities? To the hackers, yeah, <coughs> whoever. Yeah. Can census data be sold to private companies? Uh, I can help. <laughs> um, we, we have to be very careful about language. So your data record, if you're in a census survey or, or, or the decennial census, cannot be revealed. And there's a very strong law. If John or any of the census-related folks here did that, they go to prison for five years and have a $250,000 fine. Uh, so individual identifiable data is impossible. Statistics, aggregates that are created off of those micro data, that's the mission of the Census Bureau, to provide information to the American public. And the discussion about differential privacy uh, has to do with under what conditions do those statistics inadvertently increase the revelation of personal identity? And that's the advance that we're talking about. To your question, individual data cannot be sold. That's illegal, impossible under the law. People would go to jail. Statistics are the product, and those are freely given. Your, your tax-paying behavior produced those statistics. They're yours. We have a question here in the front. Oh, over here. And then we'll come to you, Seth. Yep. OK, hi, I'm Joanne. I'm from NYU also. Um, I guess it's kind of a two-part question, but is it true that the census is going to try to be like completely online? Or is it still going to be mailed? I'll take that one up. <laughs> um, so the contact strategy for the census is by mail. That means that your first invitation to take the 2020 census will either be a letter that invites you to go online and take the census, or that same letter with the, um, 
with the census questionnaire. About 80% of the households in the US will just get a letter that invites them to go online and take the census. The other 20% will get the packet uh, that um, <coughs> includes the, uh, the questionnaire. Uh, we encourage everyone to take the census online. That, that, that not only makes the data easier and better to process, it also makes uh, things that uh, people like Dr. Salvo have worried about. It makes our non-response follow-up operation a lot easier because we actually know the same day if you fill out the census online and we can adjust the workload uh, during the entire operation of self-response and non-response follow-up uh, to get um, more efficient use of all of our resources. So we definitely want people to take the census online, but our contact strategy uses uh, uh, a letter and there's actually a very good reason for that. The way you make the census accurate is you build an address list that is your starting point for where you think just about everybody in the country must live. And those address lists, 95% of those addresses are US Postal Service deliverable addresses. So we have high confidence in our ability to contact someone who might live at that address. It's true that people, especially people your age, aren't used to being contacted that way anymore, and that's an acknowledged research area that much of our research during the decade is trying to address. Uh, that particular demographic is also, uh, so single <coughs> renters is the demographic, young single renters is another demographic that's hard to count, and it's because they're hard to contact. Uh, so we hope that they will read that letter, but there will also be large-scale advertising campaign giving you the URL so that you can go online if you didn't get the letter. And you don't need <coughs> the letter to respond online. You can just begin taking the census. So my like, follow-up is like, if you don't have internet access, you can still take the census. Yes. Yes, so you take there it will on the be paper a mail form. option. <coughs> you okay. take it on the paper form, yes. Okay, cool. And, right. the, and the paper forms are targeted to the areas in the US where we know that there's low internet access or low self-response by internet. Um, just to put some more context on, on the ground context on what Dr. About said, in 2010, the problem that I mentioned earlier about um, neighborhoods with large numbers of vacant housing units that were erroneous, we didn't learn about that problem until the beginning of 2011 when the census results came out. This time around, the real-time data capture will allow the Census Bureau to see that problem as it's evolving and address it with sufficient time to fix it. So there's actually uh, some real advantages to, um, to uh, this kind of uh, intake via the internet. Question here, yeah, and then we'll go to the back. Yeah. Uh, um, Dr. Abowd, um, just I wanna make clear, it was your internal teams that found the problem with the 2010 privacy data. Do you know of any outside <coughs> Uh, attackers, hackers, whatever, who have been able to do what your internal team has done? In other words, has any data, an, any of this data gotten out, or is this just something you found in internal testing? This was an internal experiment undertaken proactively because we had figured out that this was a vulnerability and we wanted to assess the, uh, the magnitude of that vulnerability. I'm not aware of any external group attempting to reproduce what we did. Uh, some people have reproduced the reconstruction part of it, but not the re-identification part. Are you afraid that by announcing it, the, the there will be an effort now to do this? No. <laughs> I, I, had I had a different question, but I could follow up. So the, the step of actually assessing that required access to the private file, right? That's correct. Which is not released. But, 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 so the, what I think is the important thing about the announcement is that we demonstrated that there is uncertainty when you do a re-identification. That was an essential feature of the confidentiality protection system. And we also demonstrated that because we used methods where you couldn't quantify that uncertainty ex ante, we were setting ourselves up for a difficult situation if we didn't try to figure out a way to release the data where you could quantify that uncertainty before you release it and know that this is the amount of um, uh, uncertainty about that risk that 
is embodied in those data. And you have to do that to trade it off against the public mandate to release usable statistics. So it's impossible to release data with perfect privacy that have any useful uh, features. Uh, releasing zero or blank for everybody works, but it's not very useful to the users. As soon as you want the data to be useful to the users, you have to admit that there's an inherent um, quantifiable risk associated with that and control it. And we wanted to be able to control it in advance rather than have to figure it out after the fact. Last question is back here. Oh, did you have another comment? Yeah. Um, yeah, I could go after. Uh, this is our organizer of the briefing, so go, go right ahead. Yeah, okay, okay, we'll take that mic then. We'll do one more question. Very popular briefing, so glad, yes. <laughs> yep, right there. Joan Willems, Freelance. How does the census tabulate homelessness? I'm sorry, I do have a small hearing problem, uh, and I, how, and some people's does, questions I just can't hear. So. How does the census tabulate homelessness? The so we don't actually tabulate homelessness. I think your question is how do we count people who don't have uh, uh, a regular place of residence on census day? Is that your question? Essentially, so, yeah. So, yeah, the... the So we acknowledge the difficulty of enumerating populations that don't have a permanent place of residence on Census Day. The operation is conducted as a part of the group quarters enumeration in what is called for the 2020 Census the service-based enumeration. So it starts with uh, shelters, soup kitchens, and other known locations where people who don't have a permanent residence might be. It is coordinated with uh, a street effort on a particular day in each uh, area. And so th those uh, people without permanent residences are enumerated as a part of that operation. That operation was tested during the 18 end-to-end -end test, and um, we discovered that the um, address base that it works from needs a more thorough reworking in real time during the group quarters operation than it got in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and so some of the uh, final procedures for the service-based enumeration will be uh, adjusted as a consequence of that test. Yeah, uh, let me add, uh, in New York, we're going to be giving the Census Bureau in early 2020 lists of those locations, um, working with the regional office of the Census Bureau to try to get people into certain locations for persons in targeted, non-sheltered, outdoor locations. Um, that's, there's a procedure that the Census Bureau uh, does in concert with local uh, governments. Thank you all so much. That was fascinating, and we've now reached just about noon, so we'll uh, let our speakers go. But thank you again for your time and insights. Appreciate it. Yeah.